Great. Welcome to Digital Asset News. Uh, my name is Rob, and we got a lot of things to go over. So just as the uh, thumbnail and title suggest, there's actually some good news from the Federal Reserve. And we're going to take a look at exactly what they said yesterday. But before that, we'll do a quick market cap. And we'll talk about the red day, that is crypto. So we're going to talk about uh, who's in the money, who's out of the money. I'm talking about liquidations. Uh, plus, we're going to talk about a little negative decoupling. Not the decoupling you want, but the decoupling you deserve. Uh, we'll take a look at those Fed comments, and then we're going to talk about, because we, there's a big discussion about quantitative easing and quantitative tightening, we're going to take a look back at history, and I'm going to show you exactly what happened the last time the Fed came out and said, we're going to do some quantitative tightening, and uh, surprise, it is not good. And then lastly, we'll take a look at uh, how 50-plus legislations, as far as bills, are pending in Congress, and how uh, Sam Bakeman fried CEO of FDX, schools everybody in this nice little video. So we'll go over all those things and we'll do a Q&A at the end. But first, let's uh, take a look at what is going on today. And uh, you gotta remember, I know everybody's uh, a little bit down the dumps because no one likes to be in a prolonged bear market, but we knew it wasn't gonna be easy. Did anybody say this was simple? If it was so easy, everybody would do it. And that's just not how it works. And um, you just have to be mentally prepared for the long slog that is ahead of, that is a, ahead of all of us. And uh, some of you have done this once before. Some of you done it twice, three times, five times before. So it's not new to you. But just remember, yes, uh, inflation is there. And of course, it eats up uh, the dollars that are in your bank account. But you know, like I said here, uh, Ethereum just did that in like the last 24 hours. But remember, uh, these things are going to keep happening. We might even go down. Ah, we might. I mean, who knows? I don't know. We could go down further or we could go up. Nobody has really uh, much of a, of a, a crystal ball. But uh, if I have to take a guess at it, probably going to be in for some more pain. But remember, the strong do win in the end. So we're going to take a look at some positive news and some negative to give you a little balance for the day. So right now, uh, we had a pretty good uh, piece that happened for the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. And we're going to talk about some positivity that the Fed did and what that do for the market. Absolutely nothing. It actually uh, sent us into the other direction uh, as far as uh, the red day. So right now we got Bitcoin down 0.7%. Why? Well, we'll take a look. Ethereum down 5%. Uh, good news though, Tether and USD coin are uh, stable and uh, up actually 0.1%. So if you're looking for some positivity, there you go. Uh, Binance coin down XRP. Binance stable coin is up to a dollar. All right, let's take it for what it is. Uh, Tron is up for some reason, good for you Tron holders, and everything else is pretty much red. Jeez, this is uh, pretty red, except for Cello, 12.5%. And uh, I don't need to tell you because you look at your portfolio just like I do. So the question that I had was, what the heck is going on here? So first of all, uh, I'm going to jump ahead real quick. So when I see numbers like this go down, I expect the S&P to be down and NASDAQ to be down as well because they are correlated. I've been talking about this, about this for months. However, if we take a look today, let me refresh this. This is up 2% for today. That's pretty good. 2.18%. Uh, so still up. And of course, NASDAQ, I believe, is still up as well. And that's the one that's more closely correlated, but not today. So if you wanted to see some uh, uncorrelation of the markets, you got it. Unfortunately, it wasn't aware that you want it to be. So why is that? Well, if we take a look, and we can look at TA and all those things. I'm not a TA guy. I'm just not. There's way better channels than me to take a look at TA. Anybody will tell you that. But there is something to be of notice here. This is from uh, Into the Block. And you can see right here, this is just for uh, Bitcoin itself, as far as like holders in the money and out of the money. Right now, right now, you've got... Not too many people, I mean, like half as far as into the money, as far as Bitcoin. Because remember, if you're out of the money, you probably got in at 2020, 2021, maybe 2022, and you're not in the money because honestly, you haven't been around for quite some time. Now, maybe some of you got in, you sold, but this is the statistics we have. And when you got a lot of people who are still a little bit in the money and there is a bear market, and there are the macro events that are going on, which we have talked about at great length. I mean, take a look at you. just the GDP, war in Ukraine, the lockdowns of China. Uh, you can take a look at inflation rates, uh, all those things, right? You're still going to see a little bit of people in the money. And if they need some, they will probably sell some because you got to pay the bills. People got to keep the lights on. That's just, that's just how it is. However, I think as you start to see more people out of the money, which 
at some point people are like, you know what, just out. It would make a lot of sense to sell. Some people will, but I feel, not that I can have any crystal ball, but I feel that there's a lot, there's a little bit more of max pain to go through, and that is what it is. And also, just remember this, as far as holders composition by time, addresses according to their weighted average, 60% of people in Bitcoin have hold, held for over a year. Diamond hands, good for you guys. 33%, one to 12 months, and then of course less than a month is 7%. Now I am heavily in this range, in the one year plus, actually like five years plus. But this one right here, less than a month, these are people who are out of the money and who may have sold or are trading around and doing whatever that they're doing, which actually leads me to my next point, liquidations. So if you went long on Bitcoin, you know, and you want to do leverage, it's up to you. I'm not a leveraged uh, trader, but I can tell you, I take a look at these charts every so often to see what happened. And uh, this is by Bybit or Coinglass, excuse me.com. They rebranded. And you can see that uh, just uh, yesterday, you had almost about 350 million in long liquidations. And of course, shorts because it bounced around a lot. But I will tell you this if, uh, if it's me and I'm just looking at this chart as a layman, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of longs, heavy, heavy longs being liquidated here. Look at this one 800 million. Oh, wow. That was just the 8th of May. Uh, and then over here, 668 million people going long and long and long. And then whatever else. I'm not telling you to go short because I don't do that. But uh, you can do whatever you want to. But I will tell you this. Uh, I do get a lot of emails of people who don't know what they're doing. And they fall prey to leverage trades. And uh, if you know what you're doing, it's all up to you. But I will tell you this. It sure does create a lot of instability. So that's what we have for what's going on in the market. Let's jump into the main story, which is this, the buried Fed comments. And um, we're trying to find some good news that is out there. And this is one of those good news, but you have to understand that the bears are firmly in control of what is going on right now with the crypto digital world. And that is just true. You see sell-offs, you see people, I mean, shorts didn't get, didn't get liquidated, there's all longs. And they are going to push that price down. And that's just how it's going to be. So when we take a look at this here, actually, first, uh, just so you know, as far as like why uh, the S&P 500 and, what, and why NASDAQ went up is because of those macroeconomic factors, which look like this. So just real quick, uh, the reason why you, you see our stumble and there's not. Alibaba, I thought it was interesting, climbs more than 13% after the Chinese internet giant posted better than expected results as business has got a lift from COVID-related lockdowns in China. It's amazing. When you have a bunch of lockdowns in China, then people are going to order a bunch of things online, have it delivered to their apartment and houses. So there is some good parts of COVID, and that's one of them. April pending home sales fell nearly 4%, bigger than the 1.5% drop forecast in the sixth straight month of declines. That's actually good, in my opinion, because it makes uh, housing more affordable for uh, single-family homes. Mortgage applications have plunged over the past few months falling by a total of 26%. That's a lot. With no bottom in sight as potential buyers recoil from the surge in mortgage rates. It's not rocket science when you've got uh, would-be home purchases rise by 50% in eight months. Expect more of the same and it will feed into closed existing home sales. And here's the good news though. Uh, earnings report, some other came out pretty good. Weekless or weekly jobless claims came in lower than they expected by 5K. So that's a little bit of a, of a bump. And then, uh, but this wasn't so great. The second look at the Q1 GDP fell to 1.5% instead of the uh, initial estimate, which is 1.4, and of course, the negative 1.3. So even though they had this, some good news and some bad news, S&P doesn't seem to care. It is NASDAQ. It's just the problem here is uh, I think institutions, some places, Wall Street, are treating our space as a personal piggy bank. Anyhow, that's what we have. So jumping in then, to some positivity as we get out of that stuff. And this was, uh, I have um, this newsletter I get, uh, The Daily Upside. There's a link in the description. It's a free newsletter. Uh, don't really get anything for it. But uh, it just kind of shows you what's going on in the macro space. And this one really caught my attention. So uh, the Congressional Budget Office projections are talking about recession fears or easing those. And they states, and then, of course, 
what I'm going to read to you is some of these uh, quotes from different headlines. The Fed minutes show officials expecting to raise rates three times to address inflation. Fed minutes point to more rate hikes that go further than the market anticipates. So if you get headlines like these, it's a little bit of a fearful factor. Didn't seem to affect the traditional markets, just ours. But buried in the Fed minutes released yesterday was a hint that the central bank has some flexibility. More than enough, in fact, to send markets soaring on the day, which we saw. In the latest minutes from the Fed's monetary policy setting body, were that markets should expect at least two more 50-point rate hikes. I think we all were aware of that. The question, though, is, is that priced in? Some people say yes. I say no, but it is what it is. Uh, they also show the Fed plans to become data-dependent when weighing policy action. And this is super important for what we're going to talk about uh, next uh, as far as what happened with the quantitative tightening, what they're going to do right now. Data dependent is code for flexibility. And when we talk about what they're going to do with this tightening aspect, if they didn't have this flexibility and they learned from what happened before, this would be pretty awful. And then, uh, so we'll get to that in a second, but in addition to favorable verbiage from the Fed, the uh, Congressional Budget Office released data to suggest neither the economy nor inflation is quite as bad as some might believe. Inflation adjusted GDP is expected to grow 3.1% year over year in the fourth quarter. And uh, that, that's down from 5.5%, but it's up from 2019's lackluster 2.6. CBO estimates inflation measured using the CPI will cool to 4.7% in the fourth quarter. So if that is the truth, if the Congressional Budget Office says, you know what, I know we're at 8.5%, even though we really didn't tell you it was 8.5, um, we think it's going to cool down to uh, a little bit over, over half of that, and we're going to see some better days. So if that pans out, I think we're in a pretty good spot. But again, it's anybody's guess, especially with the macro environment. But uh, to balance that out, CBO delivered some short-term good news to go along with the long-term frightening news. And the bad is this. By 2032, the deficit here in America will increase to 6.1% of GDP. That's a lot. But the good news is this year it'll drop to a cool 1 trillion, which is down from 2.8 trillion. So again, these are all numbers I think that people look at. And I think that's a, a good reason why you've got these types of bumps in the market. So that part is great. But here is, it's bad news and it's good news. And it would be bad news if you just read this article. But what we just talked about, that data dependent, that flexibility, is gonna be super important. Just remember those terms right now as we talk about what the Fed's quantitative timing means. This was a great article by Christopher Ansey over at uh, Washington Post. And this was from uh, April 7th. And it's gonna break down beautifully how this, is, how this has played out in the past, not just in America, but in other parts of the world. What's potentially could happen, the history, and of course, where we go to from here. So what's quantitative tightening? I like how he says this. It's the, opposite of, it's the opposite of quantitative easing. So instead of printing a bunch of money, they're going to take all that money back, essentially. And uh, the Bank of Japan pioneered its use in 2001 after it had run out of conventional ammunition, lowering its benchmark short-term interest rate to zero. If you know anything about the economy in Japan, uh, that pretty much decimated it for a very, very long time. And it's still in a slide. Uh, correct me in the comments section. In quantitative easing, a central bank buys bonds to drive down longer-term rates as well. As it creates money for those purchases, it increases the supply of bank reserves in the financial system. The hope is that these lenders uh, pass that liquidity along as the credit to companies and households spurring growth and they don't hoard it. That's the big thing. So how does it happen? So by the Fed letting the bonds, its purchase reach maturity and run off its balance sheet, because remember it went from, I think it was 4.6 to like 9 trillion on their balance sheet. They doubled. It effectively created the money it used to buy the bonds out of thin air. And that's is essentially what you do with quantitative means. You just print it. But you can't keep doing that because that leads to superinflation, which we're seeing right now. Then the Treasury Department pays the Fed at the maturity of the bond by subtracting the sum from the cash balance it keeps on the deposit with the Fed, effectively making the money disappear. Amazing. Uh, if you try to do that in other, any other business, that's called fraud. But for the central banks, that's just a Tuesday. So, have central banks made this switch before? No. The Fed used quantitative easing for the first time 
Let me say that again. The Fed used the quantitative easing for the first time in the 2008 financial meltdown and during the weak recovery that followed. Then they implemented quantitative easing once it thought the economy was sufficiently strong. The tightening lasted for a little less than two years, from 2017 to 2019. This is super important. They've only done it once. It was a not a lesson in futility. It, it worked for what it was, but there are some caveats. So I'm going to skip this middle part. I linked this in the description. You can read this. This is the meat and potatoes. How did the markets react last time for quantitative tightening? So you had uh, Chair Janet Yellen from the Fed. Now she's part of the CFTC. Great. Uh, said in June 2017 that this is something, the quantitative tightening, that will just run quietly in the background over a number of years. It'll be like watching paint dry. <laughs> so remember, every time you hear some expert talk and say just how something won't work and something doesn't, doesn't need to happen or whatever else, remember, experts can only tell you what was. They can't tell you what will be because this was a new prospect. And Janet Yellen, for as much background as she has in the financial sector, she was wrong as well. So just keep that in mind as we move forward because crypto is one of those places that there's not a lot of people that can tell you what's going to happen. All right. Ba -ba -ba. So quantitative tightening started without a hitch in October 2017. That's pretty good, which we're here right now. But just three months later, bonds slid across the globe and stocks dropped. By November 2018, some market participants were arguing the Fed had shrunk bank reserves too drastically, leaving lenders scrambling for cash and rolling money markets. The dollar strengthened, putting pressure on emerging market borrowers that had built up dollar-denominated debt. So what did the Fed do? Well, at first, it kept the, the tightening policy. And that's when Jerome Powell came in because he took over for Yellen. And, uh, and he said, it's on aut autopilot, don't worry. So again, Powell was wrong, just like Yellen. But here's the kicker, and this is, um, this is the, the crux. After the S&P 500 index tumbled almost 16% over three weeks in December 2018, the Fed was like, maybe this isn't the best idea to keep going. It abandoned rate hikes in January and went on to announce the phasing out of quantitative tightening in March 2019. Did it calm the markets down? Uh, well, rates surged in the repo market. It's a source of funding, prompting the Fed to inject short-term liquidity, uh, and it kept going. So here's the thing. Remember in 2019, a little bit wonky, but then what did that lead to? Well, it led to 2020, and that was a pretty good year, especially for what was happening. Unfortunately, we had COVID, and they had to step in, and then they did quantitative easing yet again from 2008, and now we're back to the quantitative tightening. The thing is, though, that data dependent, what, because Jerome was around when they did the quantitative tightening in the beginning, and he hopefully, I would, I would think hopefully, would learn from his mistakes and go, you know what? We want a soft landing. We probably won't get the soft landing, but we can't just say, we can't just keep raising the, the rates. And we do not want to see like what happened in December of 2018, where we lost 16% uh, on Wall Street on the S&P 500. So I think what they're going to do, data dependent, they learned the mistakes from before and hopefully they'll say, okay, we can play around a little, a little bit because we understand what happened from the past. But there's also this part here, any new safety valves. Uh, this time, the Fed has new tools it can use to avert at least some short-term strains of financial markets. It introduced a uh, standing repo facility, which can provide as much as man, half a trillion dollars or $500 billion of cash overnight to the banking system, the repo. Uh, it's a, and a separate facility offers dollars to offer central banks around the world. So you see how things are kind of connected here? They're like, hey, we're going to give you data dependent on these rate hikes. And then we'll probably back down just like we did over here, but we have to do the right, do it the right way because we don't want to keep having uh, inflation rise. And hopefully if the CBO is correct, like they talked about over here, hopefully it does, the inflation rate goes down from 8.5% to 4.7% uh, in the fourth quarter. We will see. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then here's some other, I, it's moderate news, take it as you will. Uh, for legislation. And this is the article. So I found it interesting because I have a very unpopular opinion in the crypto space. And you know it. I believe that we should have some regulation. 
we should have some parts. We should have some clarity. And I think that will uh, really get us into the, the next level of crypto and digital assets. I don't like the ambiguity. Give me the, it's just like tax laws. Give me the rules. So I hate to say it like this, so I can bend them, not break them, but I can do what I can want to do legally and then move to that next level. If I don't know the rules, how can I play the game? This is the big problem. So I think this is what we need. Here's what we got. So Congress has introduced 50 digital asset bills impacting regulation, blockchain, and CBDC policy, which I'm not a fan of. Okay, so there's good parts in here and there's bad parts. I'm gonna, I link in the description because there's just too much to go over. So the 118th Congress has reached a milestone. 50 bills and resolutions have been introduced so far, and it's all different types. Draft legislation of stable coins from Senator Pat Toomey uh, and Josh Goatheimer, which I will tell you that if you're from the United States, we got two parties, Republicans and Democrats, and they usually never work together. But here's an example of bipartisanship. Amazing. Pat Toomey and Josh Goatheimer. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. And these are... supposed to cover the entire digital assets regulatory sphere from Cynthia Loomis, again, a Republic, a Republican and a Democrat. Kristen Gillibrand, yeah, amazing. So what we got, 50 bills identified are broken into six categories, taxation, CBDCs, crypto clarity, which I am all for, and regulatory treatment of digital assets. And then there's also the last one, issues of sanctions and ransomware, implications involving China or Russia's use of blockchain because of the sanctions and access limitations on use of crypto by U.S. elected officials. I like that. I mean, if you're going to stop them from trading stocks, I think you should, but then they should also not be able to get into crypto as well. That's just me. I mean, for the most part, if you want to use crypto to buy coffee, I could care less. Couldn't care less. So here's the positives and the negatives. And of course, people in the comments will tell you, and they are right, that sometimes regulation goes a little bit a step too far. I think that we can have a little bit of a balance, but uh, you know, that's just me. It worked out pretty well for the internet, law 230, when they wouldn't allow these different uh, companies to be sued or these blogs to be sued by whatever people actually post on their, on their website that allowed the internet to flourish and move forward. That's what I'm talking about. So this is the double-edged sword. HR 3684 became public law on November, 2021. And it's going to be implemented in terms of crypto tax reporting by January 1st, 2023. So coming up in six months or so. It provided a definition of digital assets and created a new definition for a broker. The IRS would consider someone for purposes of requiring tax as any person who is responsible for regularly providing, regularly providing any service, effectuating transfers of digital assets on behalf of another person. So that's okay, but it could potentially include miners, stakers, and programmers. So that's not good because if that happens, then these miners, they're like, I don't have, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna report on who buys uh, the Bitcoin after I mine it, or if I'm staking it, I don't have the information on, like me as a, as, as a stake pool operator, I don't have the information on you for Cardano, I don't. So if they want that, good luck, because I can't get it. And then of course, programmers, it makes no sense. If you're a programmer, how the hell would you uh, have the data for the people that are using your product. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, like like Ethereum or Cardano or whatever else. So that's bad because they screwed that up, let's be honest. But here's the good news. While the U.S. Treasury is promulgating how the industry will need to comply, there have been no less than five bills introduced in an attempt to modify or reverse the impact of the legislation. So I need to make something pretty clear here, and that is that... Uh, we're coming up for uh, elections on uh, Super Tuesday in November. So right now, there's a battle between Republican and Democrats. I think we all know that. This is one of the few times that you have a lot of leverage. You have a lot of leverage to if these people will listen to you or not, because they're all in a dogfight to either keep their seat or uh, to actually gain a seat in their respective districts. So if you make your voice heard, it's very easy. Whoever is in your district for in the United States or whoever, whoever that, you know, for whatever states or place that you're in, just Google them, find their office and send them an email and say, I would like you to be pro 
crypto. I'd like you to, and then reference this article here about things we're talking about. Uh, 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 uh. HR 3684, I don't think it's fair that minor stakers and programmers should be implemented. I'd like you to blah, 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 blah. This is one of the few times you actually have a little bit of leverage because if, it, if they're a shoe in for their job, they're not listening to you. That's just how it is. Remember, they're supposed to work for us. So use the leverage that you have. Anyhow, to move on, here's the good parts. Uh, Tom Emmer, good guy, follow him on Twitter. Public in Minnesota had introduced previously the safe harbor for taxpayers with forked assets. It excludes from gross income for income tax purposes any amount received as forked convertible virtual currency. So if something forks and you happen to gain that, there's no taxes. That would be great. It also would establish a safe harbor period to suspend any penalties to a taxpayer who receives a forked convertible virtual currency until the IRS issues regulations or guidance. That's what we should do with Gary Gensler. Until you give concrete guidance, then there should be no fines, there shouldn't be no fees, and you shouldn't be able to shut down these different uh, centralized exchanges for offering yield. Give us guidance publicly, not behind closed doors, and then we'll talk. Anyhow, uh, Susan Delbean with, uh, again, another Democrat from Washington and a Republic from Arizona, David Schweikert. I introduced the Bipartisan Virtual Currency Tax Fairness Act, would exempt personal transactions made with virtual currency when the gains are 200 bucks or less. Makes sense to me. I don't see why we should be paying capital gains on something like that. Because I mean, if you want to, if you want to use Bitcoin to buy coffee, like this classic example, why you gotta pay capital gains that? 200 bucks or less, wipe it all out. And again, I will tell you that uh, Republicans and Democrats pretty much hate each other right now, if you don't know. I mean, in, not all the time, but it is nice to see some bipartisanship. And the three laws we just talked about, or the three bills, it was bipartisan. So that's good. Some positive to take away from this. And that's pretty much it. I didn't cover the whole thing because it's super long, and I've only got 24 hours in a day. So I linked that in the description. You can check it out. There is good and there is bad, and that's what we have. And to finish this up, this one's great. So out of all these laws that are here, especially that piece where they said that there was uh, five, no less than five different bills trying to undo the, the verbiage of 3684. You know why the reason is? It's because of just awful education. And this is uh, Sam Bakeman fried This is him talking to, I believe this is a congressional hearing. And he just gets pissed off after so much time because of the stupid questions and people you know, talking down to him like he's a kid. And he just, this guy's my hero. That's all I'll say. Let me, I, I want you to hear this in crystal clear format. So let me share the tab. And let me make sure the volume's up so it doesn't blow your ears off. And I'm going to mute myself. But I, I actually found something a little bit offensive that was said. I'm going to be pretty blunt. The tr most of the traders on our platform know a lot more about these contracts than many of the people in this room, including many of the people in this room who are condescendingly talking to them about what they do and don't know and should and shouldn't be offered. Anyway, I just had to get off that, that off my chest a, a little bit. And I think it's, it's to some points about consumer choice here. I'm not saying that should be a sort of like be all and end all, but I think there is something to be said for it. And I, I think that that there's some irony um, in, 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 you know, some of, of the statements made by people attempting to protect those who know massively more than they do um, about the topic and who understand these products extremely well. Um, most of our users do. But I, I actually found something a little bit offensive that was said. I'm going to be pretty. Most of the traders on our platform know a lot. So that's it. Uh, I got to give out to Sam for, for saying it like it is like. Why are you talking down to me when you don't even know what you're talking about? So just be quiet and listen up. There's a good reason why the good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. So you can listen twice as much as you talk. Anyhow, that's what we have for today. So look, uh, a little bit long on the news, but it was pretty detailed. But uh, that's all we have. So if you got to take off, that's great. Time is precious.